Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that, that kind introduction. Uh, and I am planning on reading from Luskville tonight, so uh, I don't have to explain a lot of it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you also to George, you know? Uh, we've known each other peripherally for probably 30 years, maybe more than that. But uh, it's the first time I've heard you read. And the, uh, the way those cantos build, sort of slowly and patiently and incrementally, is really quite lovely. I really enjoyed hearing them. So it's a great pleasure. Uh, the Luskville Reductions is, as you've just heard, uh, the, uh, an account uh, or a reflection uh, on a failed relationship and we've all had them at uh, some point or another and uh, th this one was a particularly uh, uh, riveting one for me um, but the real reason I'm reading it and here I'm going to inflict my own agenda on you I'm afraid is that uh, the, you're videoing right? Mm -hmm. Brick wants a tape of, of some of these poems <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the reason I'm reading from Luskville is because I don't usually. Yeah, it, it's a difficult book to read from in part because the because it's so loosely organized and the poems sort of feel like a long sequence and sort of feel like they're separate poems and sometimes it's difficult to tell which. In any case, I'm reading from them because my publisher asked me to. <laughs> and of course they can pay. <laughs> they may well pay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start, uh, and, and one of the other things you'll notice, and, and this is also uh, because of the request of the publisher, is that most of the poems have place names in them because they want to create a map. Uh, using some of these poems and some of you we were just talking in a, in a mapping workshop uh, just before this, this set of readings which is what we're going to try and do here in Ottawa as well create a literary map. Uh, Brick's doing something the same for for their authors. I don't know Dave's probably heard about it as well. In any case and this is uh, apropos of the season uh, this is a poem about uh, the fall foliage tours uh, in uh, western Quebec. One hard morning, red blows out of the trees, too fast and loose for anything with one good leg to keep up. And the fall foliage tours are off, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> In the rescheduled afternoon sunlight, the leaves gather in drifts along Chemin de la Montagne and agree that they never wanted celebrity status anyway. <laughs> it's what the trees say, too, now that they're standing there, arm in arm and naked. Although I lived in Luxville, that's the way it said, if you live there. Uh, I did work often, my main office was in Aylmer, but I had an office in downtown Ottawa as well. And I was at some pains to arrange my travel schedule so I didn't have to cross the Champlain Bridge at, at rush hour, uh, which, was, which was a painful experience. Uh, but the, the bridge is really cool because a lot of folks, uh, mostly from the Ottawa side of the river, but a few from Gatineau as well, fish off that bridge. And so particularly in the afternoon or the very early morning, uh, you'd go, you'd drive across it and there'd be mostly old men, but, but other people too, leaning off that bridge with their fishing rods. I've learned to arrange my life so I don't have to cross the Champlain Bridge at rush hour. Everything else is fine. In the early morning, or sorry, in the early evening, old men lean over the metal rails. Perhaps they're praying, the way their hands extend in front of them. They eat 
whatever they catch. I lived uh, right on the Ottawa River, just a little bit south of the old uh, of the old settlement of Luxville. And in the wintertime, uh, this is another poem about fishermen, in the wintertime it was a really popular location for ice fishing. One still morning, just before Christmas, the huts of the ice fishermen appear. They're out over the deep current. They drill a hole through the ice, anything to be the center of attention. Black water takes the bait and they've learned patience. A thin line of smoke runs from the tin chimney straight up. I'll just do one more from here. It's one, one of the closing poems in the book. And I'm reading this one because I want to, not because Brick wants me to. <laughs> what descends on all the things of my lifetime and makes them inexhaustible? Was it just your kiss? On the seams of all the things, just the loneliness of your mouth? What enters? What escapes? Desolate, countable stars shine. Mm -hmm. now I'm going to read a completely different set of poems. Uh, one that is, for the most part, more recent, although a few of them do go back. Uh, it's called Air Miles, the sequence is. And it's, it's about travel as well. Uh, sporadic travel, not a, not a particular journey. And I got thinking about it because I was recently visiting some friends in, in Calgary and got stuck in the Calgary airport till five in the morning, which was uh, not a particularly pleasant experience. Uh, and it was made curiously more unpleasant by, by another old guy I was sitting talking with and commiserating with, and he was at first, he said, he was a medical doctor. And uh, then he said he was a, a lecturer. And then he said he was a medical examiner. <laughs> and then he said he, he was an expert medical examiner who investigated airline crashes. And then they announced that our plane was going to be delayed further because there was a mechanical failure with it. And it became increasingly uncomfortable talking to him because he did advise me that, you know, that in the last two crashes of the Airbus, the tails have fallen off. And he was full of stories like that for most of the evening. <laughs> and it was a long evening. And so I'm going to read a bunch of airplane poems that uh, I reflect or ruminate on uh, various trips I've made over the years. I'm not much of a traveler. I don't, I don't particularly like traveling, but it's been a while and, and for part of my work I had to travel a fair bit. First one's called just Ottawa, Frankfurt. We never did manage to become the gods they said we were going to become, so what now? We're tired and greasy on the last leg of an overnight flight, Ottawa to Frankfurt, and we come up out of Heathrow into an envelope of cloud that is somehow empty, just as everyone was hoping. And then, abruptly, brilliant light. A floor of bright clouds stretches beneath us and pillars of updrafted air stand at intervals like columns in a temple ruined by revolution and the subsequent indifference. You were reading that William Gibson novel where he claims jet lag is just the time it takes the soul to catch up with the body, the two traveling separate because they travel at different speeds. You have to wait for it, just like you wait for your luggage. But in some cases, I think the soul never catches up. 
It just decides to stay unattached, living off its unlimited air miles and stopping at places like this one where the clouds support its weight. This is a Lufthansa flight and you'd think the pilot would be all Teutonic business, but he puts the plane into a gentle bank around one pillar, then another, and then a third, as if there was no way of knowing where the world started, but wherever it did, it wouldn't be straight lines. And then he comes on the radio and says, the weather's fine, it should be a smooth ride all the way, and points us, sort of, towards Frankfurt. I've rarely had the privilege of traveling first class and so I always wonder what goes on up on the other side of up on the other side of those curtains. And I have one clue. I'm going to tell you about it. Overnight again over the North Atlantic and as usual I can't sleep. I've gotten up to stand in the rear galley even though the plane is all bedtime. The attendants are dozing in the back seats with wires draining their ears except for one. She has brought a plate full of still warm chocolate chip cookies back from first class. Help yourself she says, and I do. I eat them all. <laughs> this is one that's sort of about, sort of about airline food. It's Vancouver, Tokyo. All night long, dreams get recirculated, sucked in the vents, scrubbed a bit, and sent back with frayed edges and reduced bacteria count. They settle on one dreamer, nibble at the small openings. Her eyelids flutter, but she has had this dream already. So they move down the aisle, checking the window seats first, the most vul vulnerable ones, their heads against the flame resistant plastic and their mouths open. Are you comfortable, they say. Just breathe normally. These are not the sanctioned dreams, the airline dreams, the ones listed in the entertainment section of the in-flight magazine, so they need to be careful what they take from you. But there is always something, something and then nothing. Like when the attendant removes the untouched breakfast tray, you thought you wanted it, but you were still half asleep and your throat was sore from all that dry air and what was escaping you all that time. And now, of course, you're hungry. <laughs> this, this actually did happen at one point. We were on a plane taking off from the Ottawa airport and it actually slid off the runway. Ottawa, New York. You held my arm as the plane slid off the runway. We were sneaking away for a few days in New York just before Christmas and of course there was freezing rain. We weren't, ta we weren't taking off, just taxiing. So there wasn't anything dramatic about it. The plane just folded up its wings and there we were, tilted and sideways. Across the field the flashing lights of tow trucks and emergency vehicles made their way towards us and then stopped. As if it was too dangerous to move further, no one told us why. And why would they? Isn't love always about the lack of explanation, the things that don't arrive when you expect them? You knew I was just a little bit claustrophobic. So you kept stroking my arm and kept me talking the best way not to feel enclosed. And eventually we were rescued. The plane towed back to the apron and de-iced and refueled and sent out into the night again with all of its prefixes. And that night in the downtown hotel, 
We held each other as if there was nothing to explain, nothing to survive, and no one would come looking for us. These are not the kind of poems I'm going to send to the Air Canada Literary Competition. <laughs> this is Calgary, Toronto. I was in a near miss above Toronto once. We were coming in through heavy cloud and the guy beside me poked my arm and gestured to the window where the shadow of another plane passed just above us. We held our breath, then yawed and shuddered in the backwash. Well, life is always just a breath, a held breath, away from catastrophe. And you can't stop breathing. Not even here, at the luggage carousel, which keeps going round and round with nothing on it. <laughs> Just one more about flying through a storm. <laughs> it's, uh, I was flying to Mexico, Mexico City for work, but we had to go through Mazatlan. And uh, there were a lot of storms on both sides, uh, in the Gulf and on the Pacific side. But curiously, we got to Mazatlan and it cleared off. And as we were landing, you could see this field of butterflies. It was really quite remarkable. They were huge. Denver, Mexico City. All air is hard air. There's a storm in the Gulf and another winding itself up in the Pacific and the continent is squeezed into a funnel through which we all eventually disappear. If you put the air into the machine, it will make you anything it will make you butterflies. Mm -hmm. Chicago, Ottawa. I'm right at the back of the plane and the window seat beside me is empty. The woman coming down the aisle sideways is large. She's carrying a closet full of shopping bags stuffed with white, what might be shoes and discount fashions if the logos mean anything. There are a couple of other seats on the flight and she leans down to glance at them, but I know she's going to end up beside me. I'm trying to think of a way to discourage her, of making the seat look occupied. Not that that would make any difference. An attendant helps her put some bags into the overhead bins wherever there's an empty space so that she is distributed here and there along the aisle and she'll have to re-aggregate herself when we land and I'll probably have to wait behind her forever. Yes, I know how uncharitable this is. Airplanes make me uncharitable and my punishment is coming. The woman is moving down the aisle slowly. She stops to chat with someone she apparently knows and I wonder if there might be a more comfortable seat for me to move to but they're all about the same. I don't really want to chat with anyone. I just want to read and put my elbows up on the armrests every now and then. And maybe a bit of sleep. Ah oh well. The unavoidable lady has arrived. I'm already standing up to let her in. She makes me look thin. And when the attendant touches my shoulder and says, there might be a more comfortable seat up ahead. I just shake my head and say, ah, it's okay, I'll stay here. <laughs> and one more. It's a, a long flight from Budapest to Toronto. We're at 39,000 feet above the south tip of Greenland in one of those new triple sevens and it's only half full so she is stretched out across a couple of seats put her feet in my lap and finally fallen asleep. They're peasant feet, sturdy and short, the toenails abruptly clipped with a single impatient cut. And I must have actually said it out loud because she mumbled, yeah, peasant feet, peasant hands. Too bad I don't have peasant tits. And then dozed off. <laughs> We'd walked around Budapest 
until her feet got sore, then lulled in the Turkish baths, looking up at the old domes that could have been the eroded underside of several heavens. And when my hand slid down the curve of her back, surreptitiously, I thought, she said, please take your hand off my bum, loud enough for the old guy sitting across from us to hear. <laughs> now, above Greenland, she's dreaming. And in her dream, she's walking. Her feet are sore, and the heavens are silent. Thank you. Thank you.